Wonderful. Um, I'd like to thank all of you very much for joining us today. This is our first webinar that we've been doing with Creative Commons, and we've had a really great turnout. So, so excited to see everyone who's been joining us for today. Um, it seems like the audio is working okay. Um, obviously, if you've not been able to hear us, you wouldn't be hearing this now, but you can always go to Communicate from the top menu and select Audio Broadcast to hear uh, the audio for today's webinar. We have as much participation as possible during the webinar today. Um, we have different options for you to communicate with both myself, the host, um, as well as the panelists, which in this case would be Cable Green. Um, you can do so either by going into the chat box, and you can hear that there's a drop-down menu. By default, you, you would be sending me um, a private message, but you can select different options as well um, if you'd like to communicate to someone else within the webinar platform. We also have a Q&A box, and that will pop up uh, to me throughout the presentation, and we'll be uh, addressing questions at the close of today's webinar. So if you have any questions or comments along the way, please feel free to um, add in either the chat box or the Q&A box, whichever you prefer. For the agenda for today, um, I'm going to be giving a real quick introduction on the next slide, and then I'm going to pass it off um, to Dr. Cable Green, who will be presenting on open educational resources, open policy, open access, and librarians. Um, and then I'm going to talk to you guys afterwards about some of the free resources that EasyBib offers under uh, the Creative Commons license, and we'll be taking questions. Just to reiterate, um, all attendees and all registrants will be receiving a recording of today's webinar within 24 hours and professional development or certificates of completion, whatever you want to call them, um, we do offer them, but you'll need to contact me. I will be giving you all my contact details at the close of the webinar. So those are not given by default. All you gotta do is just shoot me a tweet or an email, um, and I will get that to you as soon as possible. So in a little bit um, about who we are and what we do. My name is Emily Gurr, and I am one of the in-house librarians here at EasyBib.com. Um, before I joined the EasyBib team, I was working as an academic librarian at Berry College in Georgia, and I joined the EasyBib team just about a year ago to help them with product and content development, and it's been a lot of fun, and I've been able to meet a lot of great librarians um, all over the country, and it's been a really wonderful experience so far. Um, Dr. Cable Green, he'll give you a more thorough introduction about himself, but he is the Director of Global Learnings at Creative Commons. Um, we're really excited to have him present on this topic today. For those of you who are unfamiliar with EasyBib, um, we are most well known for our free um, bibliography tool, which you can access at easybib.com, but we have premium features as well, which include things like website evaluation, research, note-taking, and citation tools that really strive to teach uh, research and information literacy to our users. On note, um, just hang tight with us for just a second. I'm going to um, pass presenter privileges off to Cable, and I'm going to unmute his microphone, and you will be able to get started. Well, um, it's all you. Okay, just doing an audio. Can you hear me? Okay. Uh, I can hear you okay. Participants, feel free to add anything in the chat if you can hear cable. Uh, hopefully, the audio should be good. Yeah, good. Like audio. So just in that window, do I say all participants if I want to send a chat to everybody? Yeah, exactly. Okay, good. Well, uh, first of all, thanks to EasyBib for hosting this session. It's, uh, it's very kind of them to do so. We've uh, had several good conversations between Creative Commons and EasyBib uh, lately, and looking forward to future collaborations. Um, as I said, my name is Cable Green. Um, my background is in, in education technology in higher education. Uh, so my career has been things like director of academic technology. Uh, my entire career, or say, and my entire career, I've been uh, for the most part working in universities and at state levels, and I've always been uh, very close in my work with librarians. Uh, mainly because what what I've always tried to do is to help uh, ed educators, mainly faculty at universities, uh, figure out how do they leverage digital technologies uh, to think about pedagogies in new new ways, and inevitably and appropriately that always 
at least in my experience, includes working very closely with librarians, church librarians, and others. And you're all very near and dear to my heart. And uh, if there's been any success I've had with faculty, it's because of the, the great support that librarians have provided. Uh, before I jump into the slides, I wanted to share just a few links in the chat window so that I don't forget them. One is if, if you're not aware of uh, this, this legislation, which is moving forward in the United States now, you should be. It's called uh, FASTER. It's the Fair Access to Science and Technology Research Act. It actually takes the NIH Open Access Policy and expands it to, uh, I believe it's 11 additional federal agencies, uh, so that when federal funds or public money is used to produce academic research, uh, after it goes to a peer-reviewed journal, there's a six-month embargo, and then it becomes available in PubMed Central and other repositories. And you all know, as librarians, if if you've looked at your budgets lately, and I'm sure that you have, uh, the cost of academic journals has gone through the roof. And we're also very aware uh, of, the, uh, of the process of academic journals. Essentially, uh, someone gets the grant, they write the article, the article is then submitted to a peer-reviewed journal, which puts about one one-hundredth of the cost of the production of the article, uh, to then turn the copyright over to that article, and then your library gets to pay uh, all over again for the same uh, article. And if you refuse to pay for the article, even though the professor at your university wrote it, it's against copyright law to use it. And open access, as it's known, has become uh, very popular. Librarians are particularly tuned in to open access. And so part of what I'll try to do, to do today is to bridge uh, your expertise in open access with some of the other uh, global efforts that are happening more broadly in open education and in uh, open policy. Uh, a couple more links just so that you have them as we're moving through. This, there's the link to the Creative Commons website. Uh, I will very likely talk about the School of Open. So let me go ahead and give you the link to that. We will be talking about open policy. So there's a link to the Open Policy Network. I'll talk more about what that is. Um, I will re reference the Open Course Library, which uh, librarians were heavily involved in producing, so there's the link for that one. And since we got uh, some friends from the United Kingdom with us, uh, I will put in a, a prime example of a funder policy around open access. This is the policy from the Wellcome Trust uh, in the UK, and it essentially says that uh, we strongly encourage anybody who takes money from us to put a Creative Commons attribution license on what they produce. So if we, uh, if we bump into the need for more links, and I'm sure we will, I will I will share them at that point. So let me see here. How do I share desktop? Do I aha share my desktop? That's nice and easy. So bear with me one second. All right. Can you just uh, let me know if you, you can see my slide? Okay. Hey. Yeah, we can see everything just fine. Okay, very good. Thank you. Uh, so first of all, um, if anybody is interested in the kind of things we're talking about today, the best way to follow uh, the work that I do and interesting work that I find of others, I uh, do is I tend to tw tweet it. So if you want to follow me at, uh, at C Green, my, uh, the green at the bottom there, uh, that's the best way to kind of stay in touch with what I'm thinking about and, and, uh, and the work of others. So I've titled this uh, OER, Open Policy, Open Access, and Librarians, and I'll do my best throughout to really uh, think about and focus how your work interacts with, with these global trends. So I always like to start with a, a big idea. So why are we talking about this? Why do we care about open educational resources? Why do we care about open access? Fundamentally, what we're talking about is, is sharing knowledge, working about uh, an education and a research dream that we all have as educators and that is that everyone in the world can attain all of the education that they, that they desire, and that more generally, society and everyone in society that has the will and initiative to get an education or read that research article and help uh, society progress, that they've got the, the access to do so. And so fundamentally, that's what we've been talking about for the last 10, 15 years, on open access and open educational resources. Another startling statistic is simply the number of people around the world who want to be part of 
higher education. So there have been uh, efforts mainly through UNESCO and the United Nations more broadly to make primary and secondary education universally available at no cost in every country. There have been uh, tremendous gains in primary education. They have a bow wave that's going to hit secondary ed and they're not ready for it, and so that's a bit of a scare. Uh, but those students are en route to higher education, and we are not ready by a long shot. And so as you read this slide, I ask you, what do you think the odds are that the world will build four major universities that serve 30,000 students each to open every week for the next 15 years? And I'll say, uh, based on the educational expenditures in most countries, save maybe China, uh, that, that's simply not in the cards. So the good news is this. This broad dream of everyone having access, uh, this isn't just my crazy idea. Many around the world have this dream. Uh, my current boss, her name's Kathy Casserly. Uh, she was at the Hewlett Foundation for several years. She wrote in 2006, and I quote, at part of the movement toward open educational resources, and I would say open access as well, is the simple and powerful idea that the world's knowledge is a public good and technology in general and web in particular provide opportunity for everyone to share, use, and reuse it, end quote. So Commons uh, just had its 10th uh, birthday, and 10 years ago, some interesting things started to happen, and three or four big ones. One is that the Internet in its current form uh, really became useful to most of us. So if the Internet was around before a decade ago, uh, but we didn't have the kinds of user interfaces and browsers and such that we're all familiar with today, and certainly not apps and the mobility devices that we have today, uh, where it was simple and easy enough for everybody to use. So that was a major change. What that enabled was not only people to, uh, to access, but to participate. So we could all become writers as well as readers. Uh, and we know that that's increasingly true today that happened was uh, devices became increasingly less expensive and that trend continues. Another thing that happened was people started to envision uh, cloud computing, which we know is in its full uh, full glory today and will increasingly become uh, less expensive to store digital resources in the cloud. The re cloud computing is, is key is, is another thing that happened a decade ago and that is in education and research, uh, much of what ha happens in libraries today what we built started to be born digital. So uh, yes, you've got millions of volumes of books in your libraries, uh, but all of those books, uh, you know, 10 years ago or so, uh, they were they were built on a computer. And you may have bought the printed version, uh, but the their, the digital file exists. And so we stood back 10 years ago and we asked the question: If, if we we'll have an education is digital and in research, uh, if Money that is produced with public funds, the cost, because of cloud computing, the cost of storing, replicating, and distributing digital things has essentially fallen to zero. It's not quite zero, but it's very close to zero, and I'll show you statistics in a moment. Um, should we share? That was the question. If, 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 uh, and moreover, we got these capabilities. What obligation, ethical, moral, and otherwise, and if you're a public policymaker, fiduciary, what obligation do we have to the public to in access to these materials? And we need to think about that. So pieces were in place, and what was lacking was a legal structure to make it legal and simple to share. So I was a professor at Ohio State more than 10 years ago. I was more than happy to share my course, but the only thing I could do before Creative Commons is I could, uh, you know, either hire a lawyer at $200 an hour to write a license, a custom open license to put on my website, or I did what I did, which was simply to put my course up on a website and say, here it is, take it, it's free. Uh, but who understands copyright law understands that I did not give you a license. In fact, uh, if, if I chose to sue you in a federal court, I might just have a chance at winning. And that made a lot of people nervous, even though it was easy to share, uh, and the marginal cost of sharing was zero. Uh, there was this hesitation to share because of copyright law, which is, uh, which is in uh, most countries, in fact, every country uh, in the world except, I think, Ethiopia. And they're actively building one now. So, uh, so this is a, a problem. And uh, of course, not everybody wanted to get their own lawyers and write their own custom licenses. And even if they did, 
would that be beneficial? Because what if my custom license was a little bit than your custom, a little bit different than your custom license? So Creative Commons came out, and this was really the best attorneys uh, and intellectual property attorneys in the world who together and said, you know, this is a relatively simple problem to solve. What we need to do is build open copyright licenses, which are freely available, which are, make it easy uh, and provide a simple standardized way to grant uh, some of our permissions to others under the terms that we uh, we decide. So the exciting thing about Creative Commons was that you didn't have to give up your ownership. You could keep your copyright, but at the same time, you could say by putting a Creative Commons license on your research article or your textbook or your course or your video or your audio file or whatever it might be, you could say to the world, here are the freedoms and the permissions that I let run with my work under the conditions that I choose. So again, one of the reasons why CC licenses, there's over half a billion items out there, is uh, these licenses are flexible and people can get a license that they want. Some of our licenses require attribution. That means if you use my, uh, my thing, my textbook, you must give me credit. You must give me attribution. Sherry says if you make a derivative work, you modify my work, you must share your derivative work under the same terms that I shared my work under. So that Wikipedia uses is an attribution share alike license. Commercial says you can use my work, but you may not sell it. You may not uh, use it for commercial advantage. And uh, and no derivatives means you may use my work for free, but you may not uh, you may not modify my work. For the most part in education, uh, we don't um, we use no derivatives because of course. Educators uh, like to modify things, and we change things all the time. Now, when you when you remix these uh, these four conditions, what you get are one of these six licenses. So, there are people talking about CC BY or CC BY SA. This is what they're talking about. BY, by the way, means attribution. Like, like uh, this book is by Cable Green. These licenses, of course, exist on this uh, continuum as well, from kind of most free or most degrees of freedom to least free. And as you are thinking at your uh, your schools, your universities, your colleges, a Creative Commons license you might want to use, particular objects, just remember that the main point of using a, a CC license in the first place is to share. And if, if your goal is to share knowledge as broadly as possible, uh, you know, I always encourage people to try to get up toward the top of this list. And generally speaking, um, what uh, was most uh, commonly pushed for and, and sought after is objects that are in the public domain, CC BY and CC BY SA. And I'll go into details about that if, if you'd like. Uh, what Creative Commons did, which was uh, rather ingenious, is they didn't just have a big, long legal document, although we certainly have that for each license. That's the bum layer, the legal code. But we have a human readable and a machine readable layer to the licenses as well. And so the human readable uh, deed is what you see when you click on a CC license on the web. So that Creative Commons website that I sent you, scroll to the bottom, click CC by license, what you'll see is the human readable deed. And this is written at a grade six level, and it's very simple to understand. The machine readable license uh, essentially allows computers, uh, things like Google and apps on the web, to actually read the license, and this is helpful because it improves discoverability. I mentioned there's lots of uh, Creative Commons works out there. That's a conservative estimate. We operate in uh, multiple uh, domains. Uh, culture is really where Creative Commons came from, so art and music and photography, et cetera. But Creative Commons is actively used in, in science and scientific research and data. Governments are using Creative Commons now in funding requirements. Uh, so one of those is the U.S. Department of Labor recently put out a $2 billion grant, that's with a B, uh, to U.S. community colleges and said, here, go build a uh, new state-of-the-art elsewhere uh, and programs. But if you take this money, everything you build will have a Creative Commons attribution license on it. And if you don't like those terms, don't apply for the grant. And of course, uh, I work in education and open educational resources and open access in other areas. Uh, important to note, this is not a U.S. Uh, phenomena. This is actually a global phenomena. We have teams, Creative Commons has teams in 70 countries around the world. Uh, in fact, uh, we've got our CEO right now in India, so we can get India on the map. 
uh, and she's there for a full two weeks working with the government and uh, and others in the academy and uh, other sectors of the society to help educate about Creative Commons and and OER in particular and open access, uh, also to establish an affiliate there. Uh, there, are, this is not some niche uh, thing. There are big adopters out there of Creative Commons. Uh, of course, I mentioned Wikipedia already, and as you you know they've got lots of articles and several contributors uh, that are contributing in 285 languages. We also have major uh, technical platform adoptions of Creative Commons to make it easy for people to not only tag their works with Creative Commons licenses, but also to, uh, to find works. So, uh, you're probably aware at your institutions that your tutors and faculty regularly, um, without uh, talking to the librarians, will go out and find images on Google Images or other, other places, and you being the stewards of copyright on your campus probably say, has that been copyright cleared? Uh, or uh, do you know that you've got the rights to use it and they probably ignore you or they never asked in the first place? Uh, try to uh, make their use legal by doing things like this. So if you go to Flickr, a uh, whole landing site, uh, Flickr slash Creative Commons, where you can go in and just see Flickr images that are under different Creative Commons licenses, and then you can, uh, if you go to Flickr's advanced search, you can actually uh, search by only CC licensed works. By the way, you can do the same thing in Google advanced search if you chose to do so. Just go to Google advanced search, scroll to the bottom. You can in, you know, algebra textbook, but but then at the bottom say only show me works that that uh, that I have the usage rights to, to do what I want with. And and what they're doing is uh, searching against the machine readable nature of of CC licenses. Uh, I've mentioned higher ed. Uh, this is there's also a, a, a ton going on in other sectors, but uh, there are hundreds of universities around the world doc, uh, documented in the Open Courseware Consortium, which is that image of the on the right. Open for our friends in the UK uh, is a, uh, a major effort of the Open University, um, where they're just doing amazing work, and as part of their mission, uh, they're sharing uh, courses under a Creative Commons license. And for those of you who may be in K-12, uh, there's also a tremendous amount of work, work uh, in K-12 uh, in in the United States. Uh, Poland has made the, the the boldest move recently, where uh, Poland not all uh, Polish school children had access to textbooks. The government has stepped in, and they will be funding the production of uh, Creative Commons attribution licensed uh, to books that meet the needs educational needs of, of those students and making them freely available in the process. One thing that I, I should have mentioned earlier is one of the benefits of a CC license work is, is uh, both that it's it's free, but that you also have uh, the legal rights to uh, to repurpose that work. And so uh, if you, I've talked a lot about OER, but the definition of OER is very specific. And this is the definition from the Hewlett Foundation, which is widely used around the world. And the OER is all this stuff. It's learning, teaching, research materials in any in any medium. So it can be print or digital. Although, as we know, there are certainly benefits to uh, digital works, given that we can store, transmit, and replicate them for near cost of zero. They have to be two things. They either have to be in the public domain, or they have to be released under an open license that permits their both free use and repurposing by others. So if it's in the public domain, that's great. It qualifies as OER. If it's not, it really needs to have a, uh, a CC license on it that permits both free use, which all CC licenses do, and the repurposing by others. So the no, the no derivatives uh, option in CC licenses don't qualify under AR definition. Uh, could you use a different license? Certainly you could. Um, most people in, in OER and OA, though, use CC licenses. And the main reason is that we've been around a decade and we steward the licenses in fact, our licenses right now are versioning to 4.0 itself has been a global effort. And as those licenses uh, come online, the new version of the licenses, uh, they will both be uh, harmonized to the copyright laws of countries around the world to make sure that they work in every country as, as they already do, uh, but they also be translated into uh, local languages so everybody can read them. I mentioned uh, the benefits of uh, search and discovery. Um, uh, you'll appreciate this as librarians. Uh, not all the resources that your teachers and faculty use are the language that they need or uh, may be accessible. So in the United States, it's called uh, 508. 
and uh, we have actually legal requirements on accessibility. And one of the benefits of having something under a CC license is that if it's not in the language you want, or if it's not fully accessible, that you can actually modify it. You've got the legal rights to modify that work to to make it uh, accessible and and uh, what you need. And of course, the big thing we talk about in in OER and and uh, and OA is you can customize. Uh, the, so if you get a, for example, a CK12 book is a has a Creative Commons license on it. These are high school STEM textbooks. Uh, they're, they're certainly free. You can download them today either from CK12's website or Amazon store. They're they're free everywhere. Uh, if you want to change it, well, if you want to change that Pearson or McGraw Hill book, uh, the answer is probably no. And if you, without permission, you're actually violating copyright, and you could be sued, and that puts your district or university at legal risk. And so the advice to your education should be: don't do that. Uh, a CC license work, however, the uh, the answer is yes. Go forth, customize, uh, make it the way you want it, and uh, follow the terms of the license, but make it the way you want. It. And of course, affordability is is huge. Um, I, I you know, but textbooks uh, in the U.S. have, have uh, passed the one thousand dollar mark. The average cost of uh, textbooks in your college bookstores is over one hundred and seventy five dollars. I'll talk about uh, the mess that we're in with textbooks in K twelve shortly. Uh, we promised to talk a bit about uh, policy and kind of the business case for. Uh, we are, and it really comes down to this uh, those affordances of digital things that I mentioned before. So, and and uh, one phrase that's around is rivalrous versus non-rivalrous resources. So, rivalrous resources, if I have it, you can't simultaneously use it. So, paper version of a newspaper, or even a book in one of your libraries, is a great example. If you have one copy of a book and it's checked out, nobody else can use it, and that's why you have limits on how long people can check out a book. For the most part, because you want to make sure that it stays in circulation and others can take advantage. You also know that digital things don't have that uh, hindrance to them. And in fact, uh, all of us today could look at CNN World or we could look at a digital copy of a book in a library and many people can look at it simultaneously uh, if you're allowed to. So I, I'm a member of my local public library, big supporter, um, but there are several times when I go to check out a digital book on my iPad and it really says, sorry, uh, too many people have checked out this digital book. Well, uh, of course, that's an artificial barrier that's been put up by the deal that the library has with the publisher. Um, it has nothing to do with the technical capabilities. So one of you know, the interesting things about, about open educational resources and open access is that we don't put those barriers up. We say to everybody in the world, here, if you'd like to use this book, use it. If you download it and change it, change it. If you do you know, whatever else, have at it. Uh, the trick on policy, and this is a picture of uh, my state capital in Washington, is that policymakers don't understand all this. They understand 21st century technical and legal tools and how they can collectively enable that dream that we talked about uh, at the beginning. And so it's our job to, to help them understand. And when I say policymakers, I don't just mean uh, your national uh, legislature or parliament, uh, although that's important. I don't just mean your provinces or your states, although that's important. Um, I also mean your institutions. I mean your principals of your elementary schools. I mean your superintendents. I mean your systems of education and the people that run those systems. Uh, we have an obligation to teach them about all of this. Otherwise, they simply can't uh, support it with policy. And I, my experience is once you walk through this with policymakers, they tend to say, well, this, this is the obvious and we should do it. So um, back to the, the idea here real quick that, in fact, cost is very near zero. David Wiley at Brigham Young University, uh, who of you may know as one of the kind of founding members of the OER movement, uh, David actually ran analysis. Uh, so this is the cost of you know, storing in the cloud. It happens to be Amazon's cloud, a 50-page textbook. Well, the images and glossy. So these are fairly large files. And you can see that the cost of uh, copying by computer is very low. And here are the costs of distribution. And the costs of dis distributing paper is still fairly high, uh, although you can even get that to zero if you uh, go through certain print-on-demand services. But the cost of distributing by internet is not quite zero, but close enough to zero that we can call it zero. So David likes to say, when copy and distribution becomes free, this changes everything. 
Now, one of the other interesting analyses that David did was looking at other industries that have been fundamentally disrupted by uh, by digital technologies, and I think it's safe to say that that education has not. Uh, to, to sort of prove the point, um, he looked at well, how much does it cost today to essentially uh, lease access to all of the? Now, these are these are U.S. numbers and U.S. media, but you know, if you get Amazon Prime or Netflix or Hulu Plus. You get access to lots of movies and TV shows, shows more than you could probably watch in the rest of your life for about eight dollars a month. That's a pretty good, good deal. Uh, music similar, right? Spotify has 15 million songs in it. I use Spotify it costs ten dollars a month. I don't have to buy CDs anymore. There's no reason to uh, get access to anything that I'd ever want to listen to. Uh, you know, as long as I'm willing to pay the nine ninety nine a month. You contrast that to you know, leasing one, also lease, by the way, leasing one uh, high enroll textbook from uh, from commercial textbook publishers, and that's about, on average, uh, just under $20 a month. So you can release all of the music and all of the movies that have ever been produced uh, by by Hollywood and the, the record industry, or uh, you can lease one textbook. And so you get the, you can see here that we are out of whack and we have not fully take advantage of what these digital technologies and the licensing enables us. And again, I go back to what are we supposed to be doing? Well, I got into education not because I wanted to make a million dollars. I never will. Uh, I didn't get into it. You know, we didn't get into it for money. We got into education, and as I expect you did, because we care and we believe fundamentally that an education and people becoming educated is good for them, it's good for their families, and it's overall good for society. So uh, as you're talking with policymakers and sort of noodling over this in your own schools and, and colleges, uh, ask yourself these questions. When the marginal cost of sharing a digital work is zero, uh, do we have an ethical obligation to share? Uh, governments are starting to ask around the world uh, how we get the maximum return on investment by requiring that publicly funded resources be openly licensed. So this is what the Department of Labor did. $2 billion grant. This is what the FASTER uh, uh, bill is all about that I mentioned uh, when we started. Now, FASTER doesn't go as far as requiring open licenses, but it mentions it in the bill, and it requires the agencies to report on how their policies compare to a CC BY requirement. Uh, and, uh, governments and educators uh, need open license content. So more and more as I talk with teachers and faculty around the world, they look in today's world, to be the best teacher that I can be and to produce the materials that I need for my classroom, I have to be able to revise and remix. So, uh, librarians and I have uh, I work with many of them all the time. Uh, they're always they're begging to get into the classroom to bring uh, resource-based learning uh, mechanisms and, and strategies into the classroom to use the resources that are in the library um, you have in your archives and that you also lease and pay so much money for. Uh, and teachers are finally starting to, to come around to that. Well, uh, openly licensed resources should be part of that uh, conversation as well. Uh, a few numbers to you know, let you know that this is serious business. 60 trillion is the number that's give or take the global economy. Percent is what on average countries around the world spend of their GDP on education. So the United States. Uh, the UK, Australia, others spend roughly 5% of their GDP. That works to about $3 trillion a year. Now, of course, not all that is in, uh, is in uh, resources. It's not in articles and textbooks and courses, but hundreds of billions of dollars a year are. And what started to happen is governments are starting to ask that question. Should publicly funded resources be openly licensed? And what additional benefits as a society do we get from that? And so, um, so that's starting to happen. And where this is headed is that open, uh, it, from a policy sense, is starting to become the default and closed is starting to become the exception. And as librarians, we're going to need your help because what's starting to happen is, and let's use this Department of Labor example, there will be increasingly amounts, mass amounts of new information, new knowledge, new files, that are going to need to be stored, archived, record, meta tagged, uh, created in a way that makes sense to people so they can find it. And so my, uh, <laughs> I have two young boys. I'm going to encourage both of them to get an LA degrees. 
uh, sum up the conversations with uh, with policymakers, these tend to be the three arguments that work best. So you ask them these three questions, you'll say yes to every one of these uh, questions, and then the rest of this conversation becomes easier. I'll send a few of these, but California has recently put up $5 million of state general funds money uh, to put out RFPs to produce CC by uh, old textbooks. Those, of course, will be available to anybody in the world that wants to use them. Uh, Columbia recently announced that it's going to do the same around 40 uh, textbooks. I've already mentioned this $2 billion Department of Labor grant. And, all of the, and there are uh, many, many more examples. Um, but the, the core idea here is, is what's on the screen, that publicly funded resources should be open licensed. Now, because there are many reasons uh, to be open, and uh, some of them are uh, reasons that you want to help people, and some of them are selfish reasons. And, and I would say they're all fine, as long as people find a reason that works uh, for them. So uh, when I'm working with, and I'll use some, uh, some American political terminology here, but when I'm working with very conservative Republicans, I find that what they're most interested in is, is the business case. They're interested in the return on investment, and they totally get the idea that we're getting milked as public education, uh, both in uh, educational resources uh, and in, uh, in journals, in uh, academic journals. They, they get that intuitively, and they're right on board. Uh, very liberal Democrats tend to be on this bottom point. It's a social justice issue. Everybody should have the right to access digital knowledge. The good news is it doesn't matter. You get them to the, the same point, and uh, these, you'll, you'll tend to find an argument that works for everybody. One I did want to mention, because the audience is primarily librarians, is that librarians, in my experience, tend to have a very pivotal role at their institutions, yielding effective teams around not only education about OA and OER, but actually creating teams that are building stuff, and also key to policy. So uh, when I was, my last job before Creative Commons, I was the director of e-learning and open education for the Washington Community and Technical Colleges. And one of the things we produced was this technology plan. So there's a URL at the top of the page. Uh, and we essentially, it was yeah, it was a tech plan, and, and it said we're going to share technology across the system. But it was also a, uh, a plan that talked about uh, OER and OA. And so we said in that, um, look, this is hard, and we will cultivate a culture and practice of using and contributing uh, to OER. And they said, and this is on page 11, uh, OER is hard, and contributing to them requires a significant cultural change. We have to think about content as a common resource that raises all boats when shared. And our catchphrase was, we need to move from not invented here to proudly borrowed from there. So not invented here is, if I didn't build it, it's crap. Probably borrowed from there is, huh, as an educator, maybe my job is to find the very best resources by working with my librarians, by reaching out through my academic community, by finding the best resources and talent wherever it may exist around the world. And if it happens to have an open license on it and I can use it at no cost and modify it to meet the needs of my students, then that's what I'll do. I'll be a synthesizer of, of knowledge uh, for my students, and, and that's my job. And uh, as obvious as that sounds, I know to all of you, that's a bit of a cultural shift, and in fact, a major one for most teachers and faculty. One, uh, I mentioned textbooks before and what, what a problem they are, but here's just one example to, to point out, and that is, uh, and back in the Washington Community and Technical Colleges, their highest enrolled course was uh, English Composition One, and you can see the enrollments here. The enrollments now are actually about 60,000 students a year go through this course. And so you can see the amount of money that students are spending on one textbook, one course, in one system, very small state. So ask yourself, is this a good use of money? Now, people look at this and they say, well, hey, you know, tough. that's a lot of kids. And uh, divide it out, 175, that's not much money. It's just part of the cost of going to college. And uh, okay, maybe. Uh, what you look at is where does this three, where does this 9.6 million come from? Well, we broke it down. It comes about a third from federal tax money. So all of you who are in the United States, you paid a third of the textbooks that were used in this English Comp One course in Washington State. We thank you for your support. Part of it comes out of state tax money, and the other third comes out of the students' pockets. The state money, by the way, is financial aid, so is the federal 
money, right? Because community college students are poor for the most part, and they need a lot of financial aid help, and so all their textbooks are covered by state and federal financial aid. This is also true in many other countries around the world. At this from an uh, investment standpoint, you say, well, this is, uh, this is really stupid, and we should probably rethink it. And so one of the links I gave you before is the Open Course Library, or you can go to Google and type in opencourselibrary.org. And what we did was we said, no more. It's okay anymore. What we're going to do is we are going to build out our entire general education curriculum, highest enrolled 82 courses. And we are going to share them under a Creative Commons attribution license. So if anybody else can use them, that's great. Knock yourself out. If you make modifications or changes, we'd sure appreciate you sharing them back with us so that we can benefit from your expertise. But we're not doing it for you, Florida. Or we're not doing it for you, United Kingdom. We're doing it for ourselves. Because our job as community colleges in the state of Washington is to produce the very best start education curriculum for our students. We're going to be smart, and we're not only going to share what we build, but we're going to drop arrogance that we might have had, put on our humble hats, and we're going to take from everybody in the world who's kind enough to share with us by putting Creative Commons licenses on their work. So physics team sat down. I said, you know, take your hands away from the keyboard. Uh, research librarians, would you please go out into the world and find all of the C-licensed physics courses? And they came back with tens of them, including physics courses from MIT and from Yale and Harvard and all over the place. They have licenses on them. And while these community colleges didn't use all that content, they used a lot of it. But is all, uh, the phase one is online. The first 42 courses are available now. If you have to take any of them, phase two is in development now. They're building the next 40. Uh, frankly, a small slice of what's out there for open courseware. There are literally thousands of courses on the web. And if you want a good search engine to get there, just go to the Open Courseware Consortium and you can see what's out there. Uh, I promised I'd mention uh, K-12. Again, use my state as an example. We spend uh, a year, uh, year after year, $130 million on textbooks. Anything is paper textbooks. Uh, Anything is digital. Um, because the books are so expensive, they cost on average $150 kids. We have about a million kids in the state, although compared to other states, that's tiny. Um, because that, our books are the following things. They're going to 10 years out of date. They're for only. The student is not allowed to use any of their study skills, write, highlight in the books, or rip pages out or whatever they might want to do that's going to help them learn. Uh, can't keep the books at the end of the year, so sorry. Yes, we value you as a learner, but we are going to tear away the educational resources that we used while you we're learning so that you can't go back and review. Uh, and of course, these books are fully copyrighted, all rights reserved. There's no CC license on them. And so, because the books are seven to 10 years out of date, the teachers look at them and say, These books, are made. I'd like to update them. The answer is no, they're copyrighted. And even if you could update them, how are you going to do so? They're not digital. And so, this is what I have in my state, in your state, or country, in K 12 or elementary or private education, make very similar. So this is, um, is that we're not alone in this. Um, bad news is that um, there's a lot of existing structures and business models out there who don't like this conversation. They have a lot of money on uh, models like this. In fact, in the United States, the textbook industry is roughly a $10 billion a year market. And do everything they can to stop this kind of conversation at your institution and uh, with your policymakers. So that Department of Labor grant a few times, uh, this was uh, a rider that was dropped on a uh, omnibus budget bill. So the U.S. Congress uh, passes these large budget bills. Uh, of course, everybody and their dog puts uh, riders or uh, additions to them. This was one that was put on. I'll let you read it. But it essentially says, you may not take a grant from the U.S. Department of Labor to build anything if a commercial entity out there that can sell it to you, or if, they're, or if it's under development. So vaporware is fair game to stop you uh, from getting a grant to build that developmental math course uh, to help your students. If you'll assume, this is my favorite part, if you're able to figure out that nobody in the marketplace can sell you this or wants to bid, uh, after you do that market analysis, you have to get the signature of the Secretary of Labor 
uh, move forward. Of course, this was defeated because it was a really bad idea. Uh, open access. Uh, the the publishers, um, I don't know if we have anybody on from the Netherlands, but Elsevier is uh, one of the biggest uh, holders of academic journals in the world. They own a big chunk of the market. Um, they and, uh, in fact, many textbook uh, companies uh, put this bill in, which basically says on academic journals, that uh, it prohibited federal agencies from conditioning their grants to require that articles reporting or they used public funds uh, in the search made available to the public online. So it's essentially the direct opposite of what the faster bill do. Uh, and and uh, <laughs> interesting was uh, if you essentially what it said is if public tax money is used to fund research, that research becomes private research once a publisher quote, adds value by managing the peer review process. For those who have been part of any kind of publishing knows that uh, all of the research, you know, is typically funded by a grant, either from a foundation or a government. Uh, then the, the quote, unquote, added value uh, in the peer review process for which faculty are not paid anything and there's some editorial and some distribution that goes into it and then the copyrights held by the publisher. There are several studies that show that by the time, these are United States numbers, by the time Enical makes it to publication, the public has put in 102,000 U.S. dollars into that work. Uh, the public then adds another $1,200, so uh, approximately one one-hundredth uh, amount, and for that they hold all the rights and they get to sell you access to work. Well, of course, this was a bad idea, but what was interesting, the bill was pulled, uh, the the sponsor of the bill said, uh, "Look, we get it. Uh, the costs of publishing are continuing to be driven down by new tech. We're going to be more open access. These are innovative models in the wave of the future. And the American people deserve to have access to the research for which they have paid. Of course, it's not about American people. This is about the public deserve to have access to the research for which they have paid." And so, what's important for all of us, and this is true from your institution all the way up to the highest levels of your government is that we have to understand the new rules that we're playing by and not fall into the trap of arguing the old business models. So in the UK in particular, and our friends in the UK can confirm this, uh, many of the publishers, the, the journals, uh, came forward and said, you can't have open access policies at uh, government or at the Wellcome Trust level uh, because that will destroy our existing business models and uh, research will go away. We simply won't have peer-reviewed academic journals anymore, and that's catastrophic to the academy. Well, that's a bit silly. It's a bit silly of an argument because, of course, uh, the academy will continue to produce research. It may be using different mechanisms, but in that the academy today is, for the most part, the research is funded by uh, philanthropic organizations and by governments. The public money and, and private money is what's funding the research. The uh, the professors at the universities around the world are doing the research, and they're paid oftentimes with public money to do that research. And then they're peer reviewing the research at no cost because that's part of being a member of the academy. And so, you know, I fail to see where the $1,200 can't easily be replaced uh, with other mechanisms. Point: Don't let yourself get sucked into old arguments. And, uh, hey, since we've got folks from the UK, I'll finish off with a Churchill quote here. Uh, Churchill said, uh, if you have knowledge, let others light their candles with it, right? And so this is the opportunity of our time. We share for the marginal cost of zero, do nothing, share knowledge with the world. The question is, should we do so? We straight and honest and expose the flows of money, as I you know, give you a few examples throughout these slides, with the open policy argument, and we should force the opposition to make their best arguments and we should be ready to counter quickly because be sure they will make arguments. But what you find is that your arguments will reign supreme with almost every group that you're talking to. They've commercial textbook and journal publishers uh, were disrupting their models. So what I find is useful when you get in a pinch is to remind people who you're talking to that only one thing matters in educational institutions. And efficient use of public, and I would add private funds, to increase student success and access to quality educational materials, uh, including research. Everything else, including all, second, all, including all existing business models, is and should be held secondary. 
outside. If the Wellcome Trust requiring CC BY or if the World Bank requiring CC BY on the research that they fund is messing with your old this models that are that were created 50 years ago, that's tough. We've moved on. We're taking advantage of digital technologies and we're taking advantage of open licensing. If your organizations are interested in this and you'd like to join this movement, uh, the organization Creative Commons stands with you. A closing thought for the 21st century, the opposite of open is no longer closed. The opposite of open is broken. Thank you much. Abel, that was fantastic and highly, highly informative. Um, I know I learned a lot. Um, some of the statistics specifically about college textbooks definitely resonated with me. Um, that always took a large chunk out of my money. Um, and I'm sure that there are tons of questions that are coming on. Um, lots of people are saying that it's been a great webinar. Um, I did want to go through a couple other things. If you have any questions, feel free to start adding them um, to the chat box or the Q&A. Uh, we'll be addressing them in just a couple minutes. Um, I did want to talk about some of the free resources that EasyBib offers that are actually licensed under Creative Commons. Um, we have two websites that you can check out, content.easybib.com slash students and content.easybib.com slash educators. And there we have uh, multiple different resources that are all licensed under Creative Commons um, free for you guys to use and um, implement in either your instruction or if you want to develop different handouts. Um, to give to your students. We have things like infographics. We have informational guides on paraphrasing, patch writing, direct quotes, um, how to use them in your writing and your research. We talk about primary, secondary, and tertiary sources. Um, and we'll make sure to link to all of the resources that Cable linked to in the beginning of the presentation as well as um, some of these resources as well when we follow up and we send guys um, the recording. So. Um, questions or comments, please type them in either the chat room or the Q&A box. Um, and here, oh, of course, the email addresses did not show up when I decided to import the slides today. Uh, let me send all of you my email address. I'll add it to the chat right now. Um, you can, yep, thank you. Well, you're, you're one step ahead of the game here. Um, if you guys are interested in receiving certificates of completion, um, you can contact me at emily at um, and we'll include that in the follow-up email as well. So let's just see if we are having any questions um, come up. Just a lot of feedback. Uh, great information, very informative. Ah, let's see here. Uh, Reynolds asks, I'm interested in the open textbooks being developed in British Columbia. Is there a website that you could direct her to? Any questions with that cable? There's a website, and at, let me <coughs> let me grab it. Um, I have to look for it here. I'll, I'll get it. Sure. Take your time. And participants, feel free um, to ask any questions or even just general comments or thoughts on cable presentation. To the, I saw one question down here. Um, ba, 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 ba. Somebody said, oh, this is Millie. Articles available in an institutional repository that have been cleared by a publisher to view full text, is that considered OER or not? So back to the OER definition. Something is OER if it has two characteristics. It must be freely available. So I'm charged for its use. I must have the legal rights to repurpose that article. So typically what that last part means is it's either in the public domain or it has an open copyright license on it. And that's what CC licenses are. They're open, open copyright licenses. And so if there's a journal article that's quote unquote been cleared, the question still is what rights do you have? So if it's in, you know, Journal. Anybody who's a copyright holder can put 
something in a repository or on their website that says, here it is, it's free. Um, but And that's good. Free is good. But if you don't have the legal rights, it's not OER. Does that make sense? And to chime in with additional questions on that, if you'd like some clarification. Okay. Uh, I have another question coming in from a high school librarian, and um, and asks, we're in textbook lockdown here in Texas. What options do we have for teachers that want high school content that can serve as an alternative to textbooks? Let's see, we're in textbook lockdown. So what does that mean you're in lockdown? Does that mean you're not allowed to buy new books, and is that because of budgetary constraints? And while he's – and um, I put in the chat window the, the C Open Textbook Project. You can see the link there. Textbook lockdown. This is interesting for textbooks because they spend more money than anybody else in the country, except maybe California. What's, we are extremely limited in the per materials teacher are allowed to use in class. Okay, I, I get where you're going with this. So, <laughs> so for those of you who are not familiar, um, in elementary education, uh, because books, uh, textbooks in K-12 in the United States have been um, paper, um, and before it was easy to make derivative works of things because it was paper, paper only, I should say, um, Texas and California really drove the market. So whatever Texas and California wanted, because they were the biggest, uh, the rest of the country just kind of had to buy. There wasn't a lot of option. That, of course, once things became digital, that started to change because it was very easy to get versions of, you know, different versions of textbooks. Um, so, Len, uh, to answer your question, this is, you know, frankly, one of the major benefits of a CC licensed textbook is that, um, is that you can modify it to meet your needs. So for example, um, if the BC Open Textbook Project or the California Textbook Project or the Washington Open Course Library Project, if any of that content you know, looks like it's maybe 80% WEXIS needs, then what you can do is, because there's an open license on it, is you can take it and you know either build the other 20% yourself or find pieces from, from other open license materials to, to, to complete it out. Um, and this is done quite regularly. Uh, in fact, uh, Utah is on a roll right now uh, using K-12 books. And even though the teachers in Utah are just super jazzed and they will tell you that it's their books and they produce the books, you know, what they've done is they've taken existing OER in the K-12 books and they can, they've been given some time and some support to modify the books. And did they write those textbooks? Nah, not really. <laughs> uh, but they certainly changed the chapters around. They changed the order. Maybe they ripped out chapter two because they didn't really like it, and they and their colleagues uh, you know, built something new. And in fact, it's been so successful that I believe the numbers are this fall, there will be 70,000 teachers, uh, elementary school teachers in Utah that will be using um, a CK-12 uh, chemistry textbook. And again, they... they each district can modify the books as they see fit because it's got a CC license on it. Oak down the list here. Um, oh, uh, by the way, uh, whoever was interested in the BC Open Textbooks, if you also go to Google and type in Creative Commons uh, BC Open Textbooks, you'll see a post that we wrote uh, about that project and some additional detail that, that you won't see on their website. Okay, let me go to Megan. Megan says, in South Africa, our government has printed textbooks at Siavula. Yes, Siavula is one of the most amazing textbook projects and a real leader in the world. Thank you for bringing that up. Uh, for the country in science and math. Uh, but I think they mostly just see them as free resources and do not yet see the benefits of open. What is it like in the States? Yeah, Megan, so you bring up a really important point here. And that if something is free, does it have value? Well, I think, you know, any of us that are uh, objective and rational, if we look at two side-by-side 300-page -side textbooks or two side-by-side -side research articles, and the quality is about the same, the length is about the same, they have the same supplemental materials around them, and are available in print-on-demand for, you know, less than fillers, 
and they're um, and they're available in multiple digital formats. More rational people would say, "Oh, they you know they're about the same," and therefore the differentiating characteristic is cost. And uh, so it's an interesting conversation that's happening in the OER community, which is you know sh well, uh, how do we get over that? How do we get over the fact that in South with South Africa, for instance, Cibola went to the South African government. The second government looked at this and said, this is amazing. By the way, um, uh, let me just type in the Ciavula website here. It's really a fantastic project. Here we go. And you should see that in your chat window now. Uh, and the government, it, you're exactly right, uh, Megan. The government looked at that and said, free, holy cow, we can increase X. Um, there was also a you know a conversation with the government to say, look, South African government, you used to spend lots of you know hundreds of rand, uh, thousands of rand on uh, commercial textbooks, and now these are free. Would you please give us you know in one U.S. dollar per book so that we can sustain our business? And as far as I uh, got in the conversation, um, the answer was no. From a policymaker standpoint, that's a really bad investment, right? We want Siavula to thrive in South Africa and continue to produce not just the books and maintain the books that they've done so far, but to branch into new areas which further benefit the South African uh, citizenry. Then you should invest like crazy. And the calculation should be we need to spend X on textbooks or we need to spend X on uh, academic research. Today we can spend you know, one one-hundredth of X and get better results. And a reasonable person should look at that and say, you know what, that's a good deal and let's do that as you know all day long. Uh, it's a challenge. It's a challenge. It's a challenge because uh, free can be perceived as having no value. It's also a challenge because the procurement laws in many nations and school districts are very rigid. It's something that's free uh, sometimes can't be considered, so some of those need to be looked at. Um, but, you know, and this is not uh, no big surprise, right? Policy and law tends to lag behind uh, society in general, and it lags behind technology uh, in a big way. So on here. Uh, Len says, I stopped several teachers from scanning graphs from textbooks for use in their classes. Fortunately, publications do provide digital versions, or at least on a CD. You know, like getting at something really important here. Teachers will do what teachers need to do to you know, provide the resources that they need for their students. And if they do, if they're engaged in illegal activities, I mean, if and or but about it, they are going to uh, put your institution at legal risk. And so, as librarians, um, you know, my major ask of you is to become, uh, you know, further knowledgeable about uh, Commons licensing and to. Uh, to give you know a session, give some professional development activities, some training uh, to your teachers and your administrators at your institutions, uh, and and help them understand uh, that you don't want to be at legal risk, and help them understand what's out there that's open that they can use that's at no cost, and help them understand the rights and the obligations that they have. So help them understand what po proper attribution means and looks like. Uh, help them understand uh, what you know like looks like. Hey, you took. You took the CK12 book. It's got a share-alike license on it. Um, that means that if you substantively modified that book and made a derivative work, you you by law have to relicense your new work under the same license. Uh, and look, this is not a choice. Like we really have to do this, or we could get sued. Uh, the the conditions of CC licenses are easy to comply with, but as somebody said before, if you don't know, you don't know. If you don't know what you don't know. Okay, let me look down here. Sarah says, what's the URL for the library BI information? Oh, uh, Sarah, that's up in the chat window. If you just scroll up, I dropped in the uh, British Columbia textbook. It's not what you're asking. You can type in another message. Back to at all of the links, um, in a follow-up email as well. So if you did miss it in the chat, um, you'll be able to get those probably the end of day tomorrow. Um, Cable, I actually, someone sent me a private message that I wanted to ask. Um, someone asked, how are MOOCs, which are those massive open online courses, related to OER? Is there any sort of connection between those two? 
good question and a, a timely question. Uh, so first, before I jump into that, I just put the Creative Commons post about the British Columbia uh, project, and now I'm dropping in another post uh, about MOOCs. And we titled it Keeping MOOCs Open. So what's interesting about MOOCs is, well, several things, but one is that in their name, it's massively open online courses. The only thing open about most MOOCs is that they're open admission, meaning that you can enter the course for free. Um, and this is, and no offense to the MOOCs, um, but they're simply trying to figure out what their revenue models look like, and they've got some really good ideas, like charging for placement in a job or uh, charging for an assessment that that could lead to credit. Uh, and there's all sorts of you know services around the content that uh, you know I, as an individual, am completely supportive of. I think they're great ideas. And to the extent that uh, college costs are out of control, not just in the United States, but in most countries, in the UK, again, as an, as an example, they're going through massive austerity measures, which include higher education. And uh, government subsidy of higher education has dropped significantly. So this is a – remember that slide that said we got to build, you know, 30,000 student universities every week to keep up with demand. In many – in most countries, we're going the wrong direction. So, you know, the question is, can MOOCs – help with that? Are MOOCs part of the solution? Um, I, 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 uh, I, I go down a trail here. Let me come back to MOOCs and open. So we're, we Creative Commons are talking with all of the big MOOCs, uh, Coursera, Udacity, edX, um, and then um, I'm blank right now. What's the name of the new one in England? Uh, uh, free, I'm drawing a blank. Somebody will type it in for me. Uh, but we're talking with them too. Is this is the Open University, and several others in England have said, "Hey, you know, we're going to have our own MOOCs as well." Um, talking with and, and a bunch of the smaller ones, including uh, Udemy and Canvas, and uh, name it. And, and frankly, I think this whole idea of MOOCs is going to explode, and pretty soon there'll be 40, 50 of them out there. Um, as to whether or not the MOOCs are open. You try to do in this blog post is say, look, open means something, and open means what I had up on the screen. It means that you've got free access and you've got the legal rights to repurpose. So, are the MOOCs today open? No, they're not. Uh, if you and I went to the Coursera website today and we downloaded uh, one of their courses, and we could do so, take us a while, right, page by page, but we could do it. Uh, if we did that, we would be in violation of Coursera's copyright. Uh, and or the copyright of the institution that contributed it, and we would be sued, uh, almost certainly. And uh, and that's not good, right? And we want to be sued. And we don't want to be at legal risk. And how do the MOOCs uh, avoid that? Well, they would put a Creative Commons license on their on their courses. So the conversation we're having with the MOOCs now is MOOCs. You've got lots of institutions that are giving you. Uh, content, and they're not charging you anything for it. At a minimum, give them a nice, simple pull-down menu when they're uploading their course that uh, allows them to choose the Creative Commons license that they want to choose. So MIT, for example, uh, has used the CC BY and CSA license, which is the distribution non-commercial share alike. Fair restrictive license, but nevertheless, license which is popular among universities. Um, Fine. That's what they want to do. Give them a pull-down menu. Let them put that on their courses. Um, that's you know better than having all rights reserved. Uh, if you're maybe University of Michigan, right, which is uh, tends to be a touch more open, they might want to put a CC BY license on it. If you're the Open University in England, you might want to have a different license. If you're the South African government and you're see of Ula to build a MOOC course, right, you might choose a different license. So the idea is to make it an opt-in, but give people choice. Um, as, as long as, you know, the MOOCs, we've been clear with all of them, you know, not to go too far in calling themselves open and certainly don't call themselves OER until they truly are. Because just like the green movement, environmentalist movement, calls it greenwashing when, uh, you know, a big oil company comes out and, and you know, puts a lot of propaganda and advertising on top of maybe a big oil spill to make it look pretty and nice. That's cause often referred to as greenwashing. Uh, we've stolen that, that that term, and we call it open washing. When somebody uh, truly isn't open, they, it's either not in the public domain, or it doesn't have an open license on it, and they're claiming to be OER. It's simply not. We'll we'll call them on the deck, and we'll do so publicly because uh, open means something, and we will defend it. Great. 
Um, Cable, are you seeing any other questions that are coming in? Um, lots of positive feedback and thanks. Um, and someone clarified the UK MOOC platform is called Future Learn. Is that what you were thinking of? Yes, that's exactly what I was thinking of. Thank you very much. <laughs> Great. Hey, uh, my, my brain's not working so well today. I'm a second day into having the norovirus, so forgive any uh, mispronunciations or missed links. <laughs> Um, great. Well, I think um, we did go over our time a little bit, so we should probably wrap this up now. If there are any last-minute questions, uh, feel free to add them to the chat box now. Otherwise, when we send out the follow-up email tomorrow, we'll make sure to include all of the links and resources that Cable has provided to us today. Um, there's lots to go through and tons and tons of useful information. Um, and we'll also be sending out the recording as well. So um, thanks again to Kate for all of your knowledge that you shared with us today. It really was probably one of the most informative webinars that I've ever co-hosted. Um, and we really look forward to working with Creative Commons down the road. And just so everybody knows, uh, of course, this uh, this recording will be under a Creative Commons attribution license. So feel free to use it as you see fit. Great. Thanks, everyone. And uh, have a great day.